Good morning and welcome to the 132nd commencement exercises of the Catholic University of America. The procession will be led by the University Marshal, Professor Regina Jefferson from the Columbus School of Law. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand as you are able.
Good morning, and welcome to the 132nd Annual Commencement Exercises of the Catholic University of America. We begin by asking God's blessing with the traditional prayer for the university, delivered by His Eminence, Cardinal Wilton Gregory, Archbishop of Washington and Chancellor of the University, after the invocation, please remain standing and join in singing the national anthem, which will be led by Dr. Sol Penance Acevedo, representing the Benjamin T. Rome School of Music, Drama, and Art. Let us pray. A prayer for the Catholic University of America. Father of light, from whom every best and perfect gift, we return your humble thanks for our national Catholic University and for the blessings great and manifold which through its ministration you have bestowed on us, our religion and our country. You were pleased, O God of wisdom, to raise it up for the glory of your name and the welfare of the church. Fulfill in it, we beseech you, your will and never failing purpose. Let your Holy Spirit abide with it and through its teaching hold us steadfast in our Catholic faith. Make its light so shine that all who are seeking after truth may come to know you who are truth itself and to keep your law that is the way of life eternal. Give our people such understanding of our university, its aims and its power for good, that they may love it even as the church loves it and strive as, one, as of one mind with the head of the church for its increase and advancement. Let us all as sharers by word and deed in the work which you have established have joy in its prosperity and comfort in the certain hope of the reward exceedingly great which you have promised them who do your faithful service for the sake of him who is the way, the truth, and the life, your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Do the 
Please be seated. President Garvey, Chancellor Gregory, members of the Board of Trustees, administrators, faculty and staff, families and friends of the graduates, distinguished guests, and members of the class of 2021. The rituals, the rituals of this day on which we mark the 132nd commencement of the Catholic University of America are meant to signify a turning point in the lives of our graduates. As students have arrived and been seated, they are all attired in similar academic clothing, much like that worn in the universities of the Middle Ages. The colorful academic hood is ceremonial. It was a mark of status and retains that symbolism today. The colors lining the hood denote the institution, in our case, gold and white, which recall the papal foundations of the Catholic University of America. The hood is trimmed with the color associated with the academic field of specialization. A complete list of these symbolic colors is given in the back of the commencement program. As the degree candidates receded, they carried their hoods in their arms. Later in the program, the deans of 11 schools of the university will present their graduates as candidates for the deg their degrees, and they will be asked to don their hoods. The ceremony will be complete when the president and the chancellor, by the power vested in each, accept the candidates and officially confer their degrees. Now fully attired like their teachers, the students will advance to another level within the broad community of scholars. For decades, we have been pleased to hold our annual commencement at the steps of the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. But this year, it's not a typical one. We are sad that we cannot be on the east steps of the shrine, but we are thrilled to be here at FedEx Field with families and friends. We extend our humble thanks to the management and staff at FedEx Field. We are also grateful to Prince George's County, Maryland, for making this event possible. You are part of the largest event to take place in the county in a year and a half. It is my pleasure to introduce and welcome the senior administrators of the university. Dr. Aaron Dominguez, provost. Please stand. Yeah. Mr. Robert M. Spector, Vice President for Finance and Treasurer. Mr. Scott P. Rembold, Vice President for University Advancement. Dr. Judy Biggs Garbullo, Vice President for Student Affairs. And Mr. Lawrence J. Morris, Chief of Staff. Also with us this morning, in addition to the Chancellor and President, are University Trustees, Mr. Joseph Carlini of Malvern, Pennsylvania, with a fan club. Chairman of the Board and an alumnus of the Class of 1984, Dr. Enrique Segura of Washington, D.C., Vice Chairman of the Board. Mr. Vincent Sicca of Fairfax Station, Virginia, and an alumnus of the class of 1983. We welcome our trustees and thank you for your presence here today. Other members of the administration of the, uh, the, administration of the university here today are assistant pro, this is a long list, so let's hold our applause to the end. Assistant Provost, Mr. David P. Long, Senior Vice, Pre Senior Vice Provost, Provost for Academic Administration and Dean of Graduate Studies, Dr. J. Stephen Brown. Vice Pro Provost for Teaching and Dean of Undergraduate Studies, Dr. Lynn Mayer. Vice Provost for Global Strategies, Dr. Julia DeMello. Vice Provost for Sponsored Research, Research Compliance and Technology Transfer, Mr. Ralph Albano. The University's General Counsel, Ms. Nancy O'Connor. The University Chaplain and Director of Campus Ministry, 
Reverend Jude D'Angelo of the Order of Friars Man Minor Conventual. The University Marshal, Professor Regina Jefferson for the, from the Columbus School of Law. The University Registrar, Danielle Spinato. That's the end of the list. It is now my pleasure to introduce the President of the Catholic University of America's National Alumni Association, Mr. Scott Flesch, to assist in the presentation of our first award. Mr. Flesch. Dear members of the class of 2021, it is my honor and privilege to serve as president of the Catholic University of America Alumni Association and to represent the association this morning. On behalf of the entire alumni family, please accept my congratulations on your momentous accomplishment. For the rest of your lives, you will be proud Catholic University alumni. I know that you'll be stay engaged and connected to alma mater. Welcome, and as our motto states, may God always be your light. The President's Award is the highest university honor presented to a graduating senior who has demonstrated prominent leadership, an outstanding scholarship, and who exemplifies the highest ideals of Christianity. Nominees should have a grade point average of 3.8 or better, and they should have distinguished themselves in various activities throughout their career at CUA. I ask Scala Shoma Urbaro of the class of 2021 to please join President Garvey and me on the stage for the conferral of the President Award. The President's, Award oh. the President's Award recognizes a commendable student leader who is an outstanding scholar, has a had a positive impact on the community, and exemplifies the highest ideals of Christianity. This year's recipient of the President's Award, Scala Ebero, has demonstrated the criteria sent forth by this award. Scala is receiving a Bachelor of Science in Architecture all while earning an outstanding cumulative GPA of 3.93. <laughs> As a resident assistant, she directly leads a community of over 50 residents. Moreover, she is seen as a leader of, on a team of RIAs who care for over 400 residents altogether. In addition to her RA duties, she involves herself with several other campus activities on campus, such as President Society, Habitat for Humanity, and Pro-Life Hospitality. She even holds the school's record in triple, triple jump from the season she spent on the track and field team. Her extracurricular involvement and accomplishments are impressive. However, what is truly notable is that she has achieved them while maintaining the highest academic standards. Scala's major, demands, Scala's major demands a lot of time and energy in the classroom and studio. Nevertheless, she continues to set her bar high and always looks to improve herself. Scala describes leadership in the following manner. A leader creates a path, a path that is sometimes the one less traveled, traveled by, but is more importantly, the one most needed. Leaders are individuals who know themselves enough to hone in on their skills in order to help other people realize their gifts and talents. Thus, leadership is an act of self-giving and of service in any form and can be given by anyone. The President's Award is given to someone who exemplifies leadership, outstanding scholarship, demonstrates the highest ideals of Christianity, and has had a positive impact on the community. Scala embodies all of these attributes. Today, we honor Scala Ebero as the 2021 Cardinal Leadership Celebration
President's Award recipient. Congratulations. When Catholic University's Board of Trustees in 2007, excuse me, the wind. On the recommendation of the President, the Board of Trustees has authorized the conferral of an honorary degree upon Joseph L. Carlini. I ask Ms. Gar Mr. Carlini to join President Garvey to my left. When Catholic University's Board of Trustees in 2017 made changes to provide a greater lay participation in university governance, the best and clearest choice to lead its efforts was Joe Carlini, BSME 1984. Likewise, two years later, when the university launched Light the Way, the campaign for Catholic University, it would have been hard to imagine setting such bold goals without Carlini as co-chair. Numerous engineering students count Mr. Carlini among their blessings because of the scholarships he and his family have generously and humbly provided. And when athletes claim victory on Carlini Field, they know how lucky they are that Joe Carlini, who played football for Catholic University, had the passion that moved him and his wife Christine to support the athletics program that taught him the lasting values of teamwork, respect for others, and leadership. Carlini was the first of his family to attend college when he left Philadelphia for Catholic University, eventually earning his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and launching a career in the technology and defense industry. Today, Carlini is described by professional peers as a leader whose business expertise and open-minded management style creates the environment for innovation. Carlini has brought these leadership skills to his service on the Board of Trustees for more than a decade. When his three-year term as chairman expired a year ago, he graciously agreed to serve an additional year to help lead the university through the challenges brought on by COVID-19. He's just the best we could have chosen, says University President John Garvey. He is deeply respected for his wise judgment and careful preparation. He lets you know he's in charge while showing great respect for every person and perspective in the room. With his wife, a fellow engineering graduate, Joe Carlini makes philanthropy a priority. As the experience of student athletes, coaches, and fans will demonstrate for years to come when they compete on Carlini Field, the university's home for men and women's soccer and lacrosse. Opened in 2019, it has already transformed athletics department programs for both Cardinal athletes and their coaches. Carlini's deep love for Catholic has been, an essential to the, has been essential to the success of the university's campaign. He inspires us to ask, why can't we, in serving students, the church, and the nation? Among his many titles at Catholic University, Carlini also claims proud parent. His daughter, Victoria, will become a nurse today as a graduate of the Conway School of Nursing, class of 2021. I never tire of coming home to campus, Carlini told viewers while lending his support to a recent virtual advancement event. The collective response from the Catholic University community is, we never tire of having you, Joe. For his example as a successful and conscientious alumnus, businessman, and community leader, and as torchbearer for the ideals of his beloved alma mater, faith, community, generosity, and service, the Catholic University of America is proud to bestow upon Joseph Carlini the degree Doctor of Humane Letters Honoris Causa. Mr. Carlini will accept his diploma now. Mr. Carlini and all honorees are already wearing the academic hoods that signify their honorary degrees as we are adapting the traditional ceremony to comply with COVID protocols.
On the recommendation of the President, the Board of Trustees has authorized the conferral of an honorary degree upon Tommy Espinoza. I ask Mr. Espinoza to please join President Garvey to my left. His professional biography describes him as a prominent architect of Latino community and business development policy and programs. For many, Tommy Espinoza, president and CEO of Raza Development Fund, is seen as a bridge builder. Espinoza made national headlines in 2018 when he delivered a eulogy for his friend of more than 30 years, Arizona Senator John McCain. News coverage highlighted the pair's long friendship and ability to work across partisan lines. McCain had asked Espinoza to co-chair his first U.S. Senate run in the 1980s. You know, I'm a Democrat, replied Espinoza. Even so, he agreed to help lead his friend's campaign. A native of Phoenix, Espinoza has dedicated more than 45 years to a career serving Latinos, helping them live in peace and with dignity. He spent his early career working in the city's low-income neighborhoods directing Latino youths and family off the treadmill of poverty and into affordable housing. He also transformed the then fledgling Chicanos por la Causa into one of the country's most dynamic forces for Latino empowerment and economic well-being. Espinoza served too as a member of President Jimmy Carter's Mexican-American Advisory Council. For 20 years, the organization he leads as CEO, Raza De Development Fund, has been the United States' largest Latino community development financial institution, providing capital to nearly 150 Latin-serving organizations nationwide. It has helped leverage more than $5 billion in loans and technical assistance for education, affordable housing, and health care projects. Espinoza was recently found advocating for more fe federal COVID relief for Main Street businesses, University Provost Aaron Dominguez observed that the more I get to know Tom, the more I realize what a tremendously positive impact he has had on the Hispanic community throughout the United States. He really is one of the great leaders, and he does it with such faith and humility. Espinoza is a member of Catholic University School of Arts and Sciences Board of Visitors. He received the NFL Football Americano Hispanic Heritage Leadership Award in 2014 from University alumnus Michael Bidwell, owner of the Arizona Cardinals, for his contributions to the Latino community. In 2005, he was honored with the Secretaria de Relaciones Exteriores Mexico, Reconocimiento OHTLI, the highest honor given to a person out of Mexico for distinguished work serving the Mexican community. For pioneering a faith-based approach to community development, his unwavering commitment to affordable housing, housing, and a lifetime of serving the Latino community locally and across America, the Catholic University of America is proud to bestow upon Tommy Espinoza the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa. On the recommendation of the President, the Board of Trustees has authorized the conferral of an honorary degree upon Pierre Manon. Mr. Manon is unab unable to join us today in person and instead is viewing our live stream from his home in France. A true pillar seeks above all else to understand the world around him. For Pierre Manon, that work has meant a lifetime of examining contemporary political life. Born in Toulouse, France, and raised in a communist household, Manant developed an early fascination with political thought. Though his early schooling took place in a left-wing environment, he was introduced to Catholicism through his teacher and later abandoned communism for the faith. After graduating from the Ecole Normale Supérieure, he became assistant to the philosopher and political scientist Raymond Aron at the Collège de France. Manon developed an even deeper interest in political philosophy. 
eventually co-founding the anti-communist journal Commentaire, to which he re remains a regular contributor. A classical liberal, Manot served as a director of studies at the Raymond Aron Center for Sociology and Politics from 1992 until his retirement in 2014. He has written more than 10 books, including his 2020 release, Natural Law and Human Rights, Toward a Recovery of Practical Reason. He remains one of France's leading voices on political philosophy and European politics. Catholic University School of Philosophy Dean John McCarthy describes Manon as a dispassionate partisan of politi political life with a prudent appreciation of both the good that can only be realized politically and the limits to what even the best political order can hope to accomplish. His reflections on contemporary political life are always bracing, McCarthy says, because they are informed by his study of the history of political philosophy. In his readings of the moderns, he joins a rare synthetic gift to great analytical power. Yet he also, yet he also has many illuminating things to say about Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, and August Augustine. Manant's work has particular value for Catholics who can look to his writings for a new perspective on their own political alignments. This shines through in a 2020 essay in which Manant reflected on the Good Samaritan and the difference between compassion and action. Merely human compassion, fellow feeling, is a passion or a sentiment that, as such, is not capable of being morally qualified, Manant wrote. Left to itself, compassion for the victim easily changes into compassion for the torturer. From a sentiment, however, compassion become, can become a virtue if it is guided by the cardinal virtues of courage, justice, and prudence. Without this guidance, however, it does more harm than good. For his profound and strikingly original exploration of the central questions of Western political thought, efforts to restore the grammar of moral and political action, in bold defense of the classical and Christian concept of liberty under law, the Catholic University of America is proud to bestow upon Pierre Manon the degree Doctor of Humane Letters honoris causa. On the recommendation of the President, the Board of Trustees has authorized the conferral of honorary degrees, uh, uh, the conferral of honorary degree upon Kathleen McChesney. I asked Ms. Ms. Mches McChesney to join President Garvey to my left. One does not rise to become the third highest ranking in the Federal Bureau of Investigation without intelligence, character, courage, and tenacity, especially if one is female in a historically male-dominated field like law enforcement. During a 31-year career in law enforcement, Catholic Kathleen McChesney established a reputation for thoroughness and credibility as an investigator, as well as for the ability to communicate hard truths to those in authority. Following her retirement from the FBI as Executive Assistant Director of Law Enforcement Services in 2002, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops recruited the Jesuit-educated McChesney to serve as the founding head of the USCCB's Office of Child and Youth Protection. While establishing that office and new protocols for responding to allegations of abuse, the prevention of abuse, and transparency and accountability for the Catholic Church in the United States, she also continued to be a national voice emphasizing the necessity of listening to victim survivors and acting on the results of independent and professional investigations of abuse. Through her consulting, work, and publications, she continues to urge more thorough screening and rigorous selection of clergy and lay people involved in Catholic ministries. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. And in this regard, Kathleen McChesney is surely most blessed. From her earliest days a police officer in King County, Washington, investigating sex crimes and homicides, through her continuing active service as an investigator and advisor, she has remained tireless in her pursuit of justice for victims, accountability for abusers, and the establishment of serious measures that prevent sexual abuse from occurring in any environment. 
As a consequence, she has earned and kept the trust not only of church leaders, but also victims and the survivor groups that represent and support them. An alumna of Gonzaga University and graduate of Washington State University, McChesney also earned a master's degree in public service from Seattle University and her doctorate in public administration from Golden Gate University. She is the co-author of Pick Up Your Own Brass, Leadership the FBI Way, and Sexual Abuse in the Catholic Church, A Decade of Crisis. She has also been honored with the U.S. President's Meritorious Achievement Award, the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Center for Women in Policing, and the Hildegard von Bignen Woman of the World Award, and the 2020 Lettere Medal from the University of Notre Dame. For her earnest and unceasing work in the protection of children and vulnerable adults, and rooting out and preventing sexual misconduct, and in advocating for the rights and respect of victims of abuse, the Catholic University of America is proud to bestow upon Kathleen McChesney the Doctor of Law, the degree Doctor of Law Honoris Causa. <laughs> On the recommendation of the President, the Board of Trustees has authorized the conferral of honorary degree upon William Chester Jordan. I ask Dr. Jordan to join President Garvey to my left. Peer into nearly any corner of the medieval history and you're likely to come upon the footprints of William Chester Jordan, the Dayton Stockton Professor of History at Princeton University. For roughly a half century, he has explored political hist he has explored hi historical realms from the Crusades and English constitutional history to matters of gender, economics, Judaism, and most recently, church-state relations in the 12th through 4th centuries. Born in the city of Broad Shoulders, he became, via Ripon College and a doctorate from Princeton, an expert and much-published scholar, author, and teacher on Europe in the Middle Ages. His topics have included Louis the IX, uh, the French king who fought in two holy crusades, and the tale of two monasteries, a history of Westminster and St. Denis in the 13th century, and two men who ran those influential English and French abbeys. His work, The Great Famine, Northern Europe in the early 14th century, earned him the prestigious Haskins Medal from the Medieval Academy of America. His most recent is Servant of the Crown and Steward of the Church, the career of Philippe of Cahors. Of late, and in, of late and in the context of current events, he has lectured on how medieval Europe dealt with an influx of migrant laborers throughout the con continent. Though they routinely traveled through the medieval countryside, even if some of the laborers appeared year after year and became somewhat familiar to the inhabitants of any number of local villages, they remained largely outsiders to the communities they served, says Jordan, who nevertheless looks for signs of the social consequences of the presence of these strangers in medieval rural society. He has been a member of the teaching faculty at his alma mater since 1973, is a fellow of the American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and has served variously as president of the American Catholic Historical Association, the Consortium for the Teaching of the Middle Ages, and fellows of the Medieval Academy of America. Long regarded as a historian at the very top of his field, Professor Jordan is happy to make his many areas of interest approachable to young learners. Two, and has edited it, he has edited a four volume encyclopedia for middle grade students. He has also generously shared his time and wisdom with Catholic University students in 2018, giving a lecture on campus and briefly taking on an undergraduate medieval history class. For a lifetime of scholarship and teaching that continues to inform our present and our future by revealing the lasting consequences of people and events past, the University of America is proud to bestow upon William Chester Jordan the degree of Dr. Humane Letters Honoris Causa.
I uh, want to thank uh, President Garvey and the Board of Trustees of Catholic University of America for the honor of the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters and for the privilege of delivering the commencement address today. Higher education is a precious commodity. As a medieval historian of France, I thought it might be of interest to tell you a story today of the early university, an institution invented in the Middle Ages, which would suggest that higher education was as precious in the 13th century, the period I study, as it is now. Yet as now, it was not available to everyone on an equitable basis. The story begins on October 9th in the year 1201, when a child was born in a village in the region then known as the Retalois, the region in the far north of France, near the present-day Belgian border, extending from the castle town of Retel on the edge of the great and still formidable uh, forest of the Ardennes. The parents were two low-born peasants, villains or serfs in the language of the time, unfree people. Their baby boy was christened Robert. As he grew up, he showed signs of extraordinary intelligence, although what he chose later on to remember about his time in, at the village school was the rambunctiousness of his schoolmates. If village life had its pleasures, it also had its limits. A boy like Robert could make more of himself, as his parents knew, if he successfully sought a professional career. No doubt it was a, str a struggle for them to meet their goal for their son, but they did succeed in obtaining freedom for the boy, probably through a healthy payment in cash, kind, or labor to the Lord who owned them. In Robert's case, he began to read for the pastorate, probably with his local parish priest. And then, exploiting a wonderful opportunity, he became a scholarship student at the College of Rattel in Paris, one of the many small associations of students supported by regional lords, in this case, Count Hugh II of Rattel, who employed people, boys, educated at the college to help administer his estates. Robert, however, did not return home to a career as an estate manager, personal secretary, lawyer, or village priest. His brilliance shone as a student, and he was inspired to pursue his studies in the higher faculties of the still quite young University of Paris. After he received his degree as a master, which licensed him to teach, he was appointed to the faculty himself. Soon, Robert's renown was such that he came to the attention of the French king, Louis IX, Saint Louis, as he later came to be known, and to the attention also of the king's formidable mother, Blanche of Castile, and that of a host of other powerful figures in the royal circle, including Louis's wife, Queen Margaret of Provence. Robert himself soon emerged as one of the king's closest confidants, helping to articulate policies of moral reform uh, in government and otherwise crafting guidelines meant to assure the just administration of the laws. Yet he never forgot or was allowed to forget where he came from. Aristocrats typically looked down on peasants, especially those from a region as underdeveloped and poor economically as the Retalois, much as East Coasters now make crude and hurtful jokes about the cultural practices and accents of Appalachians. And perhaps most condescendingly, they made wicked fun of the occasional rustic, like Robert, who made good. Despite his closeness to the king, Robert had to endure this swaggering snobbery to his face at times, as well as in a, uh, as well as in a popular song ridiculing him for advising King Louis to put more constraints on wanton aristocratic behavior. Robert obviously thought that it was worth suffering this disrespect from those who looked down on him. For only among courtier aristocrats and others in the royal circle was it possible for him to work as effectively as he desired for the common good, despite the disdain that showed on the faces of many toward his low birth. Robert never opted to skulk back to his birthplace and curse those who mocked him. In Paris, 
In this atmosphere, Robert came up with an extraordinary plan. As he had benefited from his time at the small college of Rattel, he thought it might be useful to establish another small boarding house to lodge students, who, as was once true for him, had barely enough money to pay for daily meals and minimal lodgings in the expensive housing market of Paris. He shared this idea with the Queen Mother, Blanche of Castile, a woman who is critical to this story. For it was she, it appears, who prompted Robert to think bigger. Why stop at a boarding house, a few scant rooms, furnishings, and maybe meager meal uh, subsidies? Why not, if he could find benefactors, establish a full-fledged college as a constituent part of the University of Paris? one that catered to the needs of poor folk from his region and from others as well, who otherwise would have few opportunities to study in the capital. Why did the attendees at the university, as they were at the time, have to be the children of aristocrats? The Queen Mother did not much care, actually, for them, or they for her. And they made merciless fun of her in their drunken songs. But Robert's College would be different. The students there would appreciate opportunities offered to them that they had never before thought might be in their grasp. Amid these hopes and circumstances in the 1250s was born the greatest and most enduring of the Parisian colleges, the Sorbonne, named after Sorbonne, the village where Robert was born. There's a lesson here, one supposes, for our own time. Think of the discourse on diversity and of the clarion call to offer top quality education to eager first-generation college attendees, and the concomitant desire often expressed to reach out to those who have the intellectual capacity and the dreams, but perhaps neither the means nor sufficient preparation to attend institutions of higher education. The story of Robert of Sorbonne, however, does not come to an end with the establishment of a college for financially at-risk students often linked in the scholarship a little too simply with King Louis IX's generosity. In fact, with the king's financial resources at the time otherwise committed, and though he was destined to contribute to Robert's enterprise, it was many years later before he could do so. In the early years, the first six or seven, it was up to Robert to see that the fledgling institution survived. So Robert had to fundraise, and it was an extraordinary effort he undertook. He prepared the rules and procedures, the statutes as they were called, for the new institution and assumed its headship, a position known as provisor, rather like being president, provost, dean of the faculty, and director of development all in one. He designed and instituted a preparatory or remedial program for admitted students who came inadequately or ill-prepared. Books he had accumulated during his time as a student and professor became the core of the new college's small library. And then he started his solicitations. He succeeded in getting his friend, another royal advisor, William of Chartres, once as poor a child as Robert had been, to convey a number of Parisian properties to the Sorbonne. He had done well for himself in the real estate market before he became a Dominican. Indeed, what has never been stressed before is the background in general of the early donors of, to the Sorbonne, the ones Robert so assiduously cultivated. These were men, once impoverished youths, whose talents local persons of influence had first noticed and brought to the attention of mentors and potential patrons. The Queen Regnant's physician, Robert of Douai, was another friend Robert of Sorbonne had made at court. They hit it off well, and they could have swapped stories of what it meant to struggle from humble beginnings to almost the pinnacle of influence by serving in the king's household. Those stories would have recalled also the far more and far less fortunate fates of those who had struggled hard yet failed. But Robert of Douai had been lucky enough to be selected as Queen Margaret's personal consulting physician because his medical practice in Paris was so renowned. In achieving this success, he had acquired a vast fortune, a fact deeply resented by aristocratic types who hired minstrels to compose and sing derisive verses about him too. This evidently only made him more committed to Robert of Sorbonne's enterprise. In a wondrous act of 
planned giving, Robert of Douay left a bounty in his will for the new college of the Sorbonne. When he died on the 25th of May, 1258, the Sorbonne became the recipient of a testamentary bequest of 1,500 pounds, a genuinely princely sum at the time. He also bequeathed his hoard of scholarly books to the nascent library, turning it overnight into a major research center. Two other pivotal persons to conclude this story who provided additional endowments for Robert of Sorbonne's enterprise in the earliest phase of its, of its existence were Geoffrey of Barr and William of Bray. Their social origins mirror Robert of Sorbonne's as much as those of William of Chartres and Robert of Douay. Geoffrey of Barr, though he rose to be dean of the cathedral chapter of Notre Dame of Paris, to serve in his advisor to King Louis IX, and to hold the office of cardinal priest of Santa Susana in Rome, was born into a commoner family living in abject poverty. And William of Bray was from another family of inferior social status and deep economic want. Yet he too found his way to the deanship of the Cathedral of Notre Dame of Lyon, where he also served as a legal expert, and from there to Louis IX's court, ending his career as Cardinal Priest of San Marco. All of these men would have served as examples for the impoverished students who came to the Sorbonne in the 13th century. Examples of what hard work and erudition could accomplish. Their determination that the benefits of higher education should be widely distributed, should motivate and activate us today. One of the reasons, I guess, I so like the story I've told today is that it evokes some memories of my own. Caring parents who worked hard and doubled their efforts to earn enough to send me off to college. And then the experience of college itself, which widened my horizons and enriched my understanding of the human condition through books of history and philosophy, through novels and poetry, and through interaction with inspiring and nurturing mentors and other people from traditions and walks of life I had never encountered before. In some ways, as a friend of mine once put it, the multiple experiences and many books of a good education in the best case scenario lead to confusion, but a higher state of confusion far more productive than the confusion begotten of ignorance, prejudice, and bigotry. The preparation that Robert of Sorbonne received at the Collège of Rethel, and that propelled him to continue his education in the higher faculties of Paris, also modeled mine, with teachers urging me on, which sent me to graduate school at Princeton University, and which made possible a fulfilling career as a professor. But most important, as college was liberating for those students in 13th century Paris I've spoken to you about, it was profoundly liberating for me. It made me, I believe, or at least I hope, a more humane individual. You students who are graduating in this exercise today now have the benefits of so much learning ahead of you. Never ever forget how you acquired it, and I urge you to always strive to the extent you can to preach the beatitude of education to those young people whom you encounter throughout your lives. Thank you, and good luck to you all. Dr. Jordan, the Catholic University community is most grateful to you for your thoughtful and uplifting address. By your presence and through your speech, you have made this special day of celebration even more memorable. At this time, it is my honor to present Dr. Aaron Dominguez, Provost of the University, who will present the candidates for degrees earned in course. Dr. Dominguez. Candidates for degrees earned in course will be presented to the President and the Chancellor 
by the deans of the schools of the university. Honors for undergraduate academic achievement earned by the candidates are noted in the printed program. As, it, as each dean is introduced, the degree candidates from the respective school are asked to rise. Academic hoods will not be donned until the formal conferral of degrees by the chancellor and the president. Firstly, the dean of the Tim and Steph Bush School of Business, which was founded in 2013, Dr. Andrew Abella, would all the degree candidates from the Bush School please rise. Your Eminence, Cardinal Gregory, and President Garvey, as Dean of the Tim and Steph Bush School of Business, I have the honor to present candidates for the degrees of Master of Science in Business, Master of Science in Management, Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, and Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, and Bachelor of Science, and Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, who have been approved by the Academic Senate. Congratulations. The Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning which was founded in 1992, Professor Mark Ferguson. Would all the degree candidates from the School of Architecture and Planning please rise? Your Eminence, Cardinal Gregory and President Garvey, as Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning, I have the honor to present candidates for the degrees of Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Science in Architecture, Master of Architecture, Master of City and Regional Planning, Master of Science in Facility Management, and Master of Science in Net Zero Design, who have been approved by the Academic Senate. Congratulations. The Dean of the Metropolitan School of Professional Studies, which was founded in 1979, Dr. Vincent Kiernan. Would all the degree candidates from the Metropolitan School of Professional Studies please rise? Your Eminence Cardinal Gregory and President Garvey, as Dean of your most remarkable Metropolitan School of Professional Studies, I have the honor to present our candidates for the degrees of Master of Health Administration, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Arts in Information Technology, Bachelor of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies, and Associate of Science, who have been approved by the Academic Senate. The Dean of the Benjamin T. Rome School of Music, Drama, and Art, founded in 1965, with Dr. Jacqueline Leary Warsaw. All the degree candidates, please rise. Your Eminence, Cardinal Gregory, and President Garvey, as Dean of the Benjamin T. Rome School of Music, Drama, and Art, I have the honor to present candidates for the degrees of Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Musical Arts, Doctor of Musical Arts in Sacred Music, Master of Arts, 
Master of Arts and Master of Science in Library and Information Science, Master of Fine Arts, Master of Music, Master of Music in Sacred Music, Artist Diploma, Bachelor of Arts, and Bachelor of Music, who have been approved by the Academic Senate. Bravissimo to all of you. The Dean of the Conway School of Nursing, founded in 1935, Dr. Patricia McMullen. Would all the degree candidates please rise? Your Eminence Cardinal Gregory, President Garvey, as Dean of the Conway School of Nursing, I have the honor of presenting these Conway Strong nursing candidates for the degrees of Bachelor of Science in Nursing, Master of Science in Nursing, Doctor of Nursing Practice, and Doctor of Philosophy who have been approved by the Academic Senate. Congratulations. The Dean of the National Catholic School of Social Service, founded in 1934, Dr. Joanne Regan. Would all the degree candidates please rise? Your Eminence, Cardinal Gregory and President Garvey, as Dean of the National Catholic School of Social Service, I have the honor to present the candidates for Bachelor of Social Work, Master of Social Work that have been approved by the Academic Senate. Congratulations. The Dean of the School of Engineering, founded in 1930, Dr. John A. Judge. Would all the degree candidates please rise? Your Eminence, Cardinal Gregory and President Garvey, as Dean of the School of Engineering, I have the honor to present candidates for the degrees of Bachelor of Biomedical Engineering, Bachelor of Civil Engineering, Bachelor of Electrical Engineering, Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering, Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Science in Computer Science, Master of Science, and Doctor of Philosophy, who have been approved by the Academic Senate. Congratulations. The Dean of the School of Canon Law, founded in 1923, Monsignor Ronnie Jenkins. Would all the degree candidates please rise? Your Eminence, Cardinal Gregory and President Garvey, as Dean of the School of Canon Law, I have the honor to present candidates for the degrees of Doctor of Canon Law and Licentiate in Canon Law who have been approved by the Academic Senate. The Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, founded in 1906. 
Dr. Thomas Smith. Would all the degree candidates please rise? Your Eminence, Cardinal Gregory and President Garvey, as Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, I have the honor to present the candidates for the following degrees, Bachelor of Arts with the following majors, Anthropology, Classics, Criminology, Early Childhood Education, Economics, Education Studies, Elementary Education, English, French and Francophone Studies, Hispanic Studies, History, Italian Studies, Mathematics, Media and Communication Studies, Philosophy, Politics, Psychology, Secondary Education, Sociology, Spanish for International Service. Bachelor of Science with the following majors. Biochemistry, Biology, Chemistry, Economics, International and Economics and Finance, Honors, Mathematics, Physics, Psychological and Brain Sciences. Master of Arts, Master of Science, Master of Science in Library and Information Science, Doctor of Philosophy, who have been approved by the faculty and the Academic Senate. Congratulations. The Dean of the School of Philosophy, founded in 1895, Dr. John McCarthy, would all the degree candidates please rise. Your Eminence, Cardinal Gregory and President Garvey, as Dean of the School of Philosophy, I have the honor to present candidates for the degrees of Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy, Bachelor of Philosophy, Master of Arts in Philosophy, Licentiate in Philosophy, and Doctor of Philosophy in, you get the picture, <laughs> who have been approved by the Academic Senate. God bless each and every one of you. The Dean of the School of Theology and Religious Studies, founded in 1889, Reverend Mark Morozovich. Would all the degree candidates please rise? Your Eminence Cardinal Gregory and President Garvey, as Dean of the School of Theology and Religious Studies, I have the honor to present candidates for the degrees of Doctor of Sacred Theology, Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Ministry, Licentiate in Sacred Theology, Master of Philosophy, Bachelor of Sacred Theology and Master of Divinity, Bachelor of Sacred Theology, Master of Arts, Master of Catechesis, Master of Divinity, and Bachelor of Arts, who have been approved by the Academic Senate. Congratulations, graduates. Also at this time, please recognize Professor Stephen Payne, 
Dean of the Columbus School of Law that was founded in 1899. Dean Payne and members of the law faculty are present with us today. But the degrees of George Stockter, Master of Laws, Master of Legal Studies will be conferred at the University Commencement Exercises for the Law School on Friday, May 21st at the Basilica, the National Shrine, the Immaculate Conception. Degrees earned in course will now be formally conferred. Academic hoods will be donned by the recipients after the respective degrees have been conferred. First, His Eminence, the Chancellor of the University, will confer the ecclesiastical doctoral degrees earned in course. Will all those receiving ecclesiastical doctorates please stand? In virtue of the authority committed to me as Chancellor of the Catholic University of America, I am pleased to confer upon each candidate the ecclesiastical degree for which each has been individually recommended by the School of Philosophy, the School of Canon Law, and the School of Theology and Religious Studies, and by the Academic Senate, as having satisfied the requirements for these degrees as prescribed by the Holy See. Congratulations. The president of the university will now confer all other doctoral degrees earned in course. Would all those earning doctorates other than the ecclesiastical schools please stand? President Garvey. In virtue of the authority committed to me as President of the Catholic University of America, I'm pleased to confer upon each of you the doctoral degree for which you have been individually recommended by your several schools and by the Academic Senate. Congratulations. His Eminence, the Chancellor of the University, will now confer the Ecclesiastical Licentiate and Baccalaureate degrees earned in course. Will all those receiving ecclesiastical degrees other than doctorates please stand? In virtue of the authority committed to me as Chancellor of the Catholic University of America, I am pleased to confer upon each candidate the ecclesiastical degree by, for which each has been individually recommended by the School of Philosophy, the School of Canon Law, and the School of Theology and Religious Studies, and by the Academic Senate as having satisfied the requirements for these degrees as prescribed by the Holy See. Congratulations to all of you. The President of the University will now confer all master's degrees and first professional degrees earned in course. Would all those earning master's and first professional degrees please rise? In virtue of the authority committed to me as president of the Catholic University of America, I'm pleased to confer upon each of you the master's or first professional degree for which you have been individually recommended by your several schools and by the Academic Senate. Congratulations. Now, will all those receiving baccalaureate degrees please stand? <laughs> In virtue of the authority committed to me as president of the Catholic University of America, 
I'm pleased to confer upon each of you the baccalaureate degree for which each of you has been individually recommended by your several schools and by the Academic Senate. Congratulations to all of you. Congratulations. You may be seated. The names of all the doctoral candidates will now be read alphabetically by school. Please rise and remain standing at your seat when your name is called. Please hold applause until all the names have been read. The commencement program contains the names of all the doctoral candidates, including the names of those whose degrees were conferred earlier during the academic year and the dates of conferral. From the Benjamin T. Rome School of Music, Drama, and Art, Young Su An, Yu Jun Chang, Xi'an Chen, Shanda Carice Devine, Radina T. Dosova, Bo Gao, Somi Marina Huang, Hiong Zhang Jian, Yunsi Kang, Sarah Kim, Sujin Kim, Gaga Ma, Darius Ostek, Kevin Cameron McDonald, James Hunipero Moore, Cha Young Park, Ayako Tomonari. From the Conway School of Nursing, Nazreen Ibrahim Abdumalin, Jeffrey Bergen, Kathleen M. Brandenburg, Julia M. Dinan, Kim Marie Jewett Bissett, Kelly Lynn Nicholson, Tina L. Ortiz, David Robert Want. From the School of Engineering, Majida M. Alkarji, Ibrahim Abdullah Al Mubark, Bashir Youssef Al Rashid, Litsa She, Huin Tron Hu, Lum Ka Vun, Bruno Peruki Guidio. From the School of Canon Law, Sofia Natalia Markovich and Reverend Nicholas J. Minx. From the School of Arts and Sciences, Lucy Mariana Adamski, Salina Fatima Ali, Sara Noef Al Sharif, Nuf Mohammed Al Dubedi. David Ann, Maureen Elizabeth Bowers, Matthew Thomas Contarino, Samantha A. Chalker, Fleet C. Davis, Anders W. Edwardson, Ellie K. Estefan, Arwa Ibrahim Falata, Ryan Christopher Felton, Stephen Andrew Fix, Sister Mary Agnes Griffendorf, Luis Fernando Guedes dos Santos, Maria Jose Gutierrez Bajaras, Rebecca Lynn Hamill, Sean Charles Houchins, Kelly Lavin, Sadaf Latfalian, Haley Meager, Margaret Katya Morris, Christopher, Christopher Michael Petter, Brian Michael Peel, Charles Christopher Ryan, Sean Patrick Riley, Samir Bikram Shah, Pooja Sharma, Asher Siegelman, Sean K. Terry.
From the School of Philosophy, David Michael Grothoff, Bart Jason Himmel, John Dominic Tardif. From the School of Theology and Religious Studies, David Lawrence Augustine, Daniel McCormick Bennett, David Robert Bickle, Reverend Scott David Birchall, Shailima Davis, Richard Gerard DeClue Jr., Thomas Russell Deutsch, Reverend Joseph C. Howard Jr., Reverend Selai Zal Lewin, Reverend Remigius Chinedu Okere, Zachary Porku, Timothy Rucker, Mark Vincent Rugani, Reverend Sean Michael Selai, Edward Joseph Trendowski, Eric Michael Trinka, Eric Joseph Wagner, Reverend Sean Wenger. Congratulations to all of our doctoral candidates. Pres Let me now introduce President Garvey. It's my privilege to say a final word of parting to you as I said a first word of greeting to you on your arrival at the university. Perhaps some of you saw the recent announcement by the National Center for Health Statistics that the number of babies born in the U.S. in 2020 was down 4% from 2019. This was the sixth consecutive year that the number of births declined. America's overall fertility rate is now at 1.64, the lowest level since we began keeping track a century ago, and well below replacement rate of 2.1. This got me thinking it's a lucky thing your parents didn't take such a dim view of reproduction. <laughs> if the fertility rate had been 1.64 at the turn of the century, 239 of you wouldn't be here. Just to give you an idea what that might be like, it would be as though everyone from John Abruzzi through Christian Coleman had never been born and wouldn't be graduating today. John Christian, it's good to see you here. Right? <laughs> it also got me thinking about gratitude, an appropriate virtue for an occasion like this. Gratitude is not just an emotion. We're always grateful for something, a sunny day, a loving family, an education. But in every case, we're grateful to someone to God, our parents, our benefactors. This is well expressed in the doxology we sing to the tune of Old 100th, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below. Or in the song I Love My Mama by Snoop Dogg, I just want to say I love you for life and that's the reason why I'm here now, love Snoop. Here's another interesting thing. Gratitude is due only for things that are freely given to us. I've reached the point in life where I'm eligible for Medicare. <laughs> People can get Medicare Part A, that's the hospital insurance part, if they're 65 years old and have paid Medicare taxes for 10 years. If I were hospitalized for COVID, I would expect the government to pay, but I wouldn't be grateful. <laughs> I've paid Medicare tax, that's 1.45% with no cap, for most of my life, and I figure the government owes me. In fact, in languages derived from Latin, we use the same word, grace, from the Latin word gratia, to denote both the favor freely given and our thankfulness for it. Theologians use grace to refer to the unmerited influence of divine love operating in us for our sanctification. Thus, the Council of Trent maintained that the sacraments confer grace ex opere operato as God's gift and not because of the work of the minister or the faith of the recipient. And by extension, since granting favors is the preserve of the great and the good, the English use your grace as a style of address for dukes and archbishops. Thus, Cardinal Gregory would be his grace as well as his eminence. At the same time, when we speak of grace, 
before and after meals, we have in mind our thankfulness for what's been given to us. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive. And we give thee thanks, O Lord, for these and all thy benefits which we have received from thy bounty. So one expresses gratitude to some other person for gifts freely given. This describes well the debt you owe your parents. Their bringing you into the world was the freest sort of creative act. Their effort to feed, clothe, house, and educate you was a work they undertook simply because they love you. There's a danger that attends this relationship. The one who receives is in an inferior position. His or her weakness or dependence might cause him or her to feel resentment and the giver to nourish a sense of power or superiority. And this is a lesson that parents learn when their children go off to college. The love that brought their offspring into the world, the love that raised and supported them and helped them to get a university education should not demand repayment or it's not deserving of gratitude. Romano Guardini said that he who, love, who gives must do so with reverence for the one who receives. Otherwise, he wounds the receiver's self-respect. And here's one last thing about gratitude. Aquinas says that one who confers a benefit gives two things, the affection of the heart and the gift. So too with one who receives. He should return the affection immediately, but he should also return the favor itself in greater measure if possible and at a time when it will serve the benefactor. True gratitude moves us to practice the generosity we ourselves benefit from. The ancients agree, though, that there's one particular case where we may be unable to make an adequate return. St. Thomas, citing both Aristotle and Seneca, says it is not possible to make equal repayment to one's parents. Were it not for them, we would have no diploma ceremony today because we would have no students. We call this a commencement ceremony because it's the beginning of a new phase in your life, independent adulthood. It's also the official end of your dependence on your parents and perhaps the most appropriate moment to express the gratitude that's due to them for the love that brought you into the world and to this university. So could you join me in thanking them for all they have done for you? Congratulations to all of you, and God bless you all. Thank you, President Garvey. To conclude our ceremony today, the university chaplain, Reverend Jude D'Angelo, will offer a benediction. Following Father, following Father Jude will be the singing of the Alma Mater led by Catherine Malone, who just received her Bachelor of Music degree. The text of the Alma Mater may be found at the back of your program. Please stand as you are able for the benediction and remain standing for the Alma Mater. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we are grateful for the beauty of this day. Your sons and daughters give thanks for the family and friends, faculty and staff who have supported them throughout their years here. At their time at the Catholic University of America comes to a close. May they turn their minds and their hearts to what lies ahead, even as they reflect on what has passed. Dear Lord, so often people say that the college years are the best days of their life. Let that not be the case for our graduates. Grateful for the education they have received, help them to build tomorrows where each day will be counted as the best day of their life because it is another day to serve and honor you. Let today 
and all their tomorrows be filled with a commitment to build a world of justice and peace, a world where every human being can live in freedom, a world where liberty is not an excuse for license to engage in selfish pursuits, rather where each day is filled with the responsibility for the well-being of their sisters and their brothers. Guided by your grace and the inspiration and example of Mary, the mother of your son and our mother, may each graduate find that the days and the years ahead are the best days and the best years they are privileged to live. Please bow your heads, pray for God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his kindness. May he give you his peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Congratulations to all our graduates and their families. I ask that all the graduates remain at their seats as we will dismiss those seated on the field by row in just a few moments following the departure of the stage party. It's my great pleasure to declare this academic convocation for the 2021 commencement of the Catholic University of America officially concluded. Congratulations. Congratulations.